I think we're ready to begin. On behalf of City Lights booksellers and publishers in San Francisco and Burning Books in Buffalo, New York, I'd like to welcome you to the first of what is a four-part series about anti-fascist movements and street-level organizing. These events are curated by Hillary Moore and James Tracy and draw their uh, inspiration and origins from the recently released book, No Fascist USA, The John Brown Anti-Klan Committee and Lessons for Today's Movements. It's published by City Lights Books in San Francisco. Copies of the book are being sold today by Burning Books. We're gonna be posting a link in the comment section of your screen. So please, please do purchase the book. If you haven't already, it really helps out an awesome bookstore and uh, they're feeling the pinch during COVID times as are most indies. You'll also be helping out uh, City Lights Publishing as well. So uh, today's event is being co-sponsored by SURJ uh, showing up for racial justice. SURJ is a national network of groups and individuals working to undermine white supremacy and to work for racial justice. Uh, through community organizing, mobilizing, and education, SURJ moves white people to act as part of a multiracial majority for justice with passion and accountability. Uh, so they work to connect people across the country while supporting and collaborating with local and national racial justice organizing efforts. SURJ provides a space to build relationships, skills, and political analysis to act for change. So you can learn more about them at showing up for justice, uh, sorry, uh, showing up for racial justice.org. Um, so I'd also like to take a moment now to say a few words about our speakers. Uh, regret to say that Hillary Moore could not be with us tonight. She will be uh, joining us for some of the future events, uh, but uh, definitely joining us tonight is uh, James Tracy. Uh, he is an author, organizer, and instructor of labor and community studies at City College of San Francisco. He is the co-author of Hillbilly Nationalists, Urban Race, Rebels, and Black Power, Community Organizing in Radical Times, and also the author of Dispatches Against Displacement, Field Notes from San Francisco's Housing Wars. Uh, James is also a really awesome poet, I might add. Um, uh, he will be joined by Shane Burley. Shane is a filmmaker and author of Fascism Today, What It Is and How to End It. Uh, his work is featured in Jacobin, In These Times, Salon, Truth Out, and uh, other outlets. Uh, there's going to be a Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please use the chat function to post your questions. Uh, so before we begin, I would like to welcome uh, Leslie James Pickering of Burning Books in Buffalo, New York, our sponsor for today's event, to say a few words and uh, to get the program started. Leslie. Hello, Leslie. Uh, I need to unmute you. Hello. Hi, Leslie. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'm Leslie. I'm with Burning Books. Um, we are a radical bookstore, sort of focusing on the more controversial and uh, perhaps confrontational elements of struggles for justice, equality, freedom, and autonomy, etc. So um, just want to say real quick that I read this book as soon as it came out because of its association with uh, various clandestine sort of underground formations that I'm personally kind of obsessed with. Um, so, uh, you know, it was really interesting to see how the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee tied in with these other uh, historical events, many actual other historical events and uh, organizations and individuals who fought, sacrificed um, to make, you know, the world a better place and, um, and who are still in some cases paying the price. So um, I, I found that really interesting. And that was before everything kicked off with George Floyd. And so now obviously this is a very timely um, situation that we're in. Uh, in relation to this book and the topics that it's covering. So um, just wanna say that um, this is important for a number of different reasons, uh, not just because we're in a, in a period of um, fascism that I wish wasn't happening, but, um, but also because it is closely tied as we're seeing with many of our struggles these days to a whole lot of other stuff that was going on that's also incredibly important and incredibly intense. So um, I just want to say kudos to the authors and everyone who worked on this book. It's a really good read and uh, a really unique look at uh, unfortunately not very well known piece of history that is incredibly important. So with that, um, you know, there's a direct link to purchase the book in the events details page. And if you can't manage to navigate that, you can just go to 
burningbooks.com and find it there very easily. Um, thanks again to everyone. All right. Hey, uh, thanks for, for introducing us, Leslie. I really appreciate it. Uh, James, you want to kick us off a little bit? Um, yeah, uh, so I'm really happy to be here with you, Shane. I think your book, Fascism Today, what it is and how to end it is the beginning point for, uh, you know, for studying of, of fascism today, as the title implies. Uh, but when your friend says, hey, I need a good a, a good book to begin my understanding of uh, what's what's going on with this horrible develop, uh, development of resurgent fascism. This is the book you give you, you give them. Uh, it's it's just just fantastic. Uh, we've been friends a long time, uh, but my respect for your scholarship is uh, is 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 galactic. So uh, That's our really book, kind of you to say. Thanks. Um, our book, No Fascist USA, is about a um, about an organization called the John Brown Anti Klan Committee that got together in 1977, largely coming out of the prison support work of the uh, folks locked locked up because of the COINTELPRO crackdowns of the 70s and 80s, and then um, then evolved and changed in uh, in many many ways to really confront the uh, the emergence of the far right of the 70s and 80s. There were radicals in the Reagan years. I don't, so oftentimes I don't think we talk enough about the Reagan years when we con consider what's happening today, but we obviously see, see, uh, see links. And um, they, um, they, they started off because they, you know, they got a letter from, uh, from some, somebody who was incarcerated in upstate New York, say, alerting them to the uh, fact that the Ku Klux Klan had infiltrated the prison system in upstate New York and asking for out, um, outside solidarity to uh, help publicize and expose that. So um, with that, uh, let's get to talking. We mm -hmm. have some questions for each other. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll come out, kick them off so you can kind of answer yeah. some pertinent questions. So the book uh, really seamlessly traces together what's a really complicated history and really complicated politics, and it does it really brilliantly. And one of the things that I thought about a lot right now when we were kind of preparing for this is actually the conversation I had with Linda Evans when I interviewed her. Actually, you had set up the interview when I was doing my book to talk a little bit about the John Brown in, uh, in, in part of my book. And the first thing that she asked me was, explain to me how you understand the role of the police in white nationalism. She didn't want to talk until she heard me explain how I understood it and then gave me a little education on some other theory, uh, which I think right now in this situation, I'm, I'm in Portland, Oregon, for people who don't know. And today, I believe it's day 69 of continuous protests against police violence, where there's been a kind of a huge, huge influx of, of, of violence, both from local police, but also from federal officers that were ordered in under Trump's executive order. And so we've seen just a huge use of munitions and, and crowd control, things like that on the ground. And, and also just in the wake of the George Floyd murder and the ongoing kind of uh, presence of police violence and communities of color, people are talking a lot about what is the role of the police how is it different than what we call kind of insurgent white nationalists? So maybe, you know, the terrorist far right or things that are not a part of the state and what role does have playing together? And John Brown had a very clear analysis. And I think part of it came from what you unpacked, which was that the prison guards in upstate New York that you were mentioning, they were organizing with the Klan and at the same time organizing with the prison guards union. So it was a kind of simultaneous thing. They were organizing as prison guards and as kind of white nationalists. And so there was a certain kind of uh, symbiotic relationship between those identities. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how John Brown understood the police and its relationship to white nationalism. Well, how I, under how, how I understand it is that, while today the idea that of uh, the, police, uh, the police and the military being a target for organizing by the far right uh, is not is not controversial. It's accepted that that's a fact. At the time, the John Brown Anti Klan Committee was uh, was sounding the alarms on these things. It wasn't like it was a mystery. Certainly, um, you know, 
I found most of, most of the, the supporting documentation for our interviews through New York Times articles. So it wasn't a mystery, but it still wasn't heavily accepted by many parts of the progressive movement of the left of of the left left movement for many different uh, uh, many, many different reasons. So we see law enforcement and the military constantly being a place where uh, people from the far right want to organize in uh, a, because of the, you know be, because of, of of the proximity to power proximity to legitimate uh, legitimization and obviously proximity to guns and the the actual physical apparatus that need, that, that are needed to oppress people in the fashion that the that the farthest parts of the right would would like like to it wasn't simply a, a public policy uh, initiative like white supremacy via the planning code. It was uh, white supremacy via guns, rifles, and uh, the takeover of institutions. And I think that's that's something that we have to talk about on the left is that, you know, most people on the left uh, would never think that, uh, you know, while there's a tradition of people on the left going into factories to organize and uh, things like that, like Sojourner Truth did, uh, there's, you know, I think most of us would probably reject the idea of going into the army or the police to counter organize against the right, but it is a, still a major place where they're building power. I will uh, wrap up this this part by saying that John Brown, while they were certainly prophetic in in calling, uh, you know, call, you know, call, calling attention to this. Um, some you know it was pointed out to me by a friend that the slogan the cops and can can go hand in hand um at least in the 80s and it kind of you know what we remain seeing wasn't was true but not always true we have many times when the fbi and police got into f firefights with militias in the 80s and things like that but i think their basic analysis was ab was, was absolutely correct Okay. So let's start with the basics. Uh, what what definitions of fascism do you find uh, do, uh, do, do you find particularly useful, and which ones do you think are not useful? Yeah, um, I think people. I, I've noticed that people are a little surprised with the way I answer this question because um, I think it's not the answer that you find in a lot of left literature. Certainly not in a lot of radical literature. Um, but I have a very kind of, um, my, my, my definition that I use about fascism is basically based on two tentpoles. So on the one hand, it's the belief in human inequality, that people are fundamentally unequal. And two, that um, I said in a, the kind of belief in essentialized identities. So that identities that are fixed, immutable, and they define you rather than you kind of defining them. So they choose you rather than you choose them. Those are kind of wonky tentpoles of this. And so they have to be kind of put into context a little bit. So that identity is usually racial, but it's not always racial. And the belief in human inequality is something that runs really fundamentally counter to kind of modern liberal democratic values and post enlightenment society, basically. Um, my, my definition of fascism, those are the two primary aspects. I use secondary stuff, obviously the cult of violence, the turn towards authoritarianism, um, uh, some degree of populism, mainly that this is not just something that happens from the top down, but it's actually something that has the mass participation of people, usually defined as a privileged sector of the working class participates in it. Um, all of that is sort of built on what has been called the new consensus approach, or in a lot of ways built on Roger Griffin's analysis of what they called paleogenic ultranationalism. But the point being is that there is a really a sense of ideological depth to it. And I think a lot of times when people talk about it, they talk about what I consider slightly more ancillary things, you know, what the state does, how it acts, how it looks, those sorts of things. And the problem I have with that is that a lot of those visions are built on an earlier model of the far right, mainly what happened in interwar Europe, but we don't have states and social movements that work the same way then. So instead, in an effort to try and find an essential core to it that would exist in all places, you know, what does you know, the alt-right have in common with the BJP, have in common with the integralist movement, you have to go to that fundamental core. Um, the kind of definitions I don't find useful at all, um, for example, are a lot of the ones that you find in traditional Orthodox Marxist literature about, you know, calling it the, um, the, the most parasitic element of finance capitalism. Those are definitions that tell you absolutely nothing 
Um, and instead, what they're trying to do is tell you about who becomes fascist or how fascist movements rise, how fascist movements work. Um, and the way I respond to that is basically one is that they're usually incorrect. Uh, but two, also, that's not really defining what fascism is. I think what my, the definition that I use in the book and what I talked about before, what it is lacking is a really clear definition for how fascism arrives, how it rises and how it builds up steam. And I, and I think the reason for that is that that's an open question. And so I think what we're having right now in the US, whether or not this is the, the turn into fascism, those are, I think, complicated questions and they're not ones that are answered by a definition of fascism. Instead, we have to look at both like historical precedents of fascism rising, but also just authoritarianism in general, how states work, um, how political mobilization works, political parties and things like that. In particular, I think we learn a lot more about what's happening about the, the national populist wave in Europe um, and to a degree in, in South America to learn about what's kind of taking place here. Thank you. Let me, um, we, you know, we're, we're largely in alignment, of course. Um, I think I certainly, um, although there has been a lot of shock, you know, shocking uh, experiments in far right organizing actually reaching out to um, individuals and communities of color, I still would put, you know, really centralized white supremacy and, and race and racism within it. Uh, but what, what I'm curious about is the idea of inequality, because although I agree with you, uh, I think that you don't have to be a fascist to believe in, in, in the essential inequality of human beings. I think there's a lot of liberal elected officials and liberal human beings that might not want to kill over uh, their beliefs, but in the end, um, you know, in, in the end believe that, that uh, in inhuman inequality, it expresses itself maybe through uh, public policy instead of, instead of uh, tiki torches. Yeah, I mean, there's a difference between like the programmatic results of policy and the intended conscious kind of proactive uh, mm -hmm. pursuit of it. And so like the, the difference that was used a lot of post-war post fascist esoteric literature like Julius Ebel and others was that these, that the creation of, strat of cleanly stratified hierarchies is how society is best seen as healthy. So right now we live in a vastly unequal world, right? And the no, one's, the no one in power is doing anything particularly uh, motivated to, to change that fact. It's a little bit different than having an insurgent politics that actually says capitalism is not unequal enough. We need to enforce inequality at a very key fundamental level. And that inequality is going to be dictated by these identities. And I think to go back to what you said about white supremacy, white supremacy, um, and I mean like not just the status of white supremacy, but kind of the, the thinking of white supremacy motivates this concept of identity in general. You know, there is this kind of concept that Western colonialism turned back on itself is what fascism is. And I think there's a, a lot of kind of truth in the way of thinking that the colonialist uh, kind of apparatus of thinking about white identity and about splitting the working class through those sorts of identities is what creates the model for this kind of essentialized identity. And it's one that actually applies to people. So for example, I'm, I'm of Jewish heritage, that doesn't define me in any way. It was defined onto me. The idea of categorizations that are really implicit to white supremacy are then put onto other people and whether or not those identities are then mobilized in a really caustic way to be essentialized, that really comes from that entire model. Great, great, uh, yeah, great clarification, thank you. Let's see, I think I have you next. Okay, so I, I, I I wrote down what I thought was kind of uh, some controversial uh, questions, uh, basically. Um, you know, there's a real universal or semi-universal, I should say, it's not universal for the reason I'll get to, semi-universal critique of nationalism in anti-fascism. Um, and this includes kind of left nationalist movements and uh, seeing instead um, an anti-national politic that's really kind of critical, critical of nation states, critical of uh, nation forming, even to a degree critical of national liberation movements or the idea of exclusionary policies, things like that. Except that John Brown was both an anti-fascist group and one that supported a certain amount of nationalist movements, uh, black nationalist movements, Republic of New Africa and other things. How do you kind of negotiate that uh, left nationalism and their anti-fascism. What do you agree with when it comes to their nationalist politics and what do you disagree with? Well, personally, I believe in the politics of self-determination, which means that if desired by the massive amount of, of oppressed people to leave, they have to be given, uh, given that choice. That said, I don't think that that's my 
what my hope for the future of humanity is. Uh, but uh, I would say that instead of critiquing forms of le of left uh, left nationalism, and certainly there's a critique for for every critique of anything. First of all, read Ed Anasi's great book, Free the Land, that gives a, so much fantastic uh, context and research about the Repu founding of the Republic of New Africa. But understand the context. You're talking about uh, the resurgence of, nas of black nationalism and left nationalism that happened within an international decolonial movement. It also happened at a time where domestic violence against black people was spiking particularly uh, particularly hor horribly. I mean, it has a long, long history, but the resurgence that we're referring to now is the 60s and 70s uh, thing. So understand where it came from. And basically, um, I would rather spend my time fighting for a world where, er where there's so much justice in it that nobody feels like they have to run off and make, mm -hmm. make their own nation. But that's not my choice to, uh, uh, choice to make as an Italian American. Uh, if there was uh, like the Panthers had 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 proposed a gigantic plebiscite, and uh, that was that was truly the the desire of the majority of Black people. I think would be uh, obligated to um, uh, to to uh, sub support that. It's an enormously complicated, and I think that uh, my friend my friend Ed does a far better job at teasing out some of these the, these nuances. But John Brown Anti Klan Committee believed in self deter. Uh, determination, and they had a direct alliance with organizations that believe uh, that, the, uh, that believed uh, believed in that. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel I do feel like uh, with when we talk about these issues, sometimes we we paint everything with I think you suggested it, with these gigantic brushes. People throw out the word identity politics. Well, are you talking about the Black Panther Party or are you talking about Kamala Harris here? You know, I think it's a time to really drill down on the differences because we say nationalism. Well, does that mean that any time that, um, you know, that a group of oppressed people want self-determination, want control of their own culture and their destiny, um, that, that's, that that's somehow on par with what Richard Spencer is proposing? Absolutely not. That's, 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 that's ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it, there's a, a nuance that has been lost in the discussion because those aren't really a part of our discussions in public social movements any longer. Uh, it's not a common part to kind of talk about uh, about uh, nationalist movements or separatist movements as part of a, a, a national liberation struggle that happens domestically, which is how the John Brown uh, talked about it as uh, actually liberating colonized people in the U.S. and had that anti-fascism and the movement against capitalism and white supremacy was a decolonial movement domestically. Ab 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 absolutely, Amaz you know, ab amazingly complex his uh, history. But as you dig into it and realize the, uh, the the context that it arose, it makes a lot more sense why 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 people moved 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 that way. Um, let's talk a little bit about music. Our book talks about the fantastic work uh, done by John Brown Anti Klan Committee and many others about confronting far right entry into the punk rock scene. This is where I first met John Brown Anti Klan Committee as they were uh, in Vallejo, California, selling newspapers and encouraging us to uh, stand up against the Aryan Woodstock uh, concerts of 19 1989. There's this fantastic tradition going back to the UK, but spreading all over the world uh, around rock against racism, using music to confront the far right, to create a new common sense to get all Gromsky in on it. Um, but you've been doing such fantastic work uh, around uh, seeing the, what I never thought would be possible was the revolutionary anti-racist potential of neo-folk. Never thought it would have happened until I read your blog. You Want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Yeah, so so people who, who don't know, neo-folk is, is kind of a post-industrial music genre um, that brings together a lot of like folk music traditions and a lot of kind of, I guess, romantic art forms, uh, pre-Christian European spirituality, things like that, which was perfect for the far-right musicians who started a lot of it. And they basically came in with a kind of Gromskyan uh, uh, point of view. They wanted to build a metapolitics. Basically, they wanted to build a cultural space for far-right thinking. It wasn't explicitly political. It was then instead uh, what was kind of called apolitical. 
building on a lot of work of, of Julius Ebla, a European New Right, a lot of uh, kind of far right philosophers. But the point was is to romanticize Europe's past as a way of building up a, a national identity. But at the same time, there was artists doing almost the same thing with the opposite point of view. They were looking instead at liberatory potentials of, of past traditions. They were looking at liberation movements. Um, they were also just looking at kind of uh, the romantic art forms as a way of building kind of utopian vision. They didn't want to be a part of that, but they wanted to build up their own kind of world of it. So a lot of those musicians I tried to work with to uh, get their voices out there since they were not the loudest voices. And, you know, the loudest voices were, you know, Death in June and Soul Invictus and bands that have been associated with the far right. So start to build a, a kind of website, a number of things. We're going to be doing a online music festival. Um, I am not ready to say the date for it yet, but it'll probably be at the end of next month. And then also doing a, a compilation to raise money for uh, the National Bail Fund um, in support of the movement for Black Lives. Um, but the, the, the thing was that once we had kind of started asking uh, for musicians to be a part of something, to start speaking up in support of both anti-fascism, but also just speaking out against the far right in the movements, people started running in droves. I can't even keep up with it. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of bands that I think people weren't aware of before. The same is happening in a lot of kind of genres where the far right just pump their way in. So the same is true, maybe even more true in black metal. The same is true in a lot of industrial scenes. People are willing, they're having basically the, the question has been called on them now and people are drawing a line. And so in a lot of these kind of like quote unquote extreme genres where shocking material was often a cover for far-right politics and racism people aren't doing it anymore they're done so i think now is the time to make that break and we have to make a conscious political space for them a conscious uh, creative space for them so that we're able to build up a counter movement otherwise those those kind of uh far-right agitators are basically able to define what cultural spaces are um, and that's not happening any longer i'm going to pop a, a playlist into the link uh, so people can check out some of these bands awesome I mean, we live in such a weird, weird time that even Depeche Mode has to uh, has to renounce a uh, an endorsement by Richard Spencer. Uh, as long as we're talking about uh, you know about music and resistance, I want to give acknowledgement to the fact that Bill Crossman from John Brown Anti Klan Committee, who organized a lot of the punk rock uh, activism that uh, that was associated with John Brown, is here. Uh, we'll be asking. Uh, asking Bill to uh, be unmuted at the end to he's also a fantastic poet to this to this day so we'll um, uh, before we get to question and answer we'll have 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 Bill up do one of his great uh, great poems okay well I I, I, uh, I picked up on something that was kind of talked about at the end of the book um, and it's come up before it is about how John Brown handled anti-Semitism or maybe didn't handle anti-Semitism um, or, or basically developed over time about the role of anti-Semitism. And this was brought up about some of their discourse with Matthew Lyons, who wrote the foreword to my book, and about how anti-Semitism is one of the kind of central planks of the far right and of white nationalist movements, but is often overlooked on the left. And you know, the left has kind of a, a difficulty about managing how to understand anti-Semitism. How do you think John Brown either handled or didn't handle anti-Semitism? Well, the first thing that we need to be really, um, really explicit about is that the John Brown anti-Klan community was not an anti-Semitic organization. No, of course not. Of course. Um, it's easy, you know, they were accused of it back in, uh, back in the day over their strong support for, uh, for Palestinian uh, liberation. Most of their members were Jewish, not all, most of them were, and they saw it, uh, they saw a lot of their work around supporting self-determination struggles as the outgrowth of the stories that were handed down to them uh, from their uh, from their parents and their grandparents around surviving the Holocaust. So I just want to be really clear um, for that because when they were accused of, I think uh, back in the day, you know, I've seen all the original documents. There's not a lot there, right? And so I just want to be unequivocal about that. That said, I think that if you look at the if you if you uh, look in some of their newspapers uh, and everything, you see some of the mistakes that anybody in the left who's not Jewish makes, right? If you're not really paying attention to the role of anti and anti-Semitism, and I see a lot of a thread. We left this out of the book. Um, I see a lot of the threads going back to unresolved uh, tensions from the civil rights movement, and you know, there's a time, you know 
horribly clumsily worded. They were, there was a neighborhood in Chicago, a mostly Jewish neighborhood, I forget the name, that very valiantly and bravely fought against uh, neo-Nazis coming into their neighborhood. And then they didn't turn out when the same Nazis were in the black, uh, uh, black communities and the brown communities of Chicago and organizing in Uptown. Um, and, you know, that's a valid critique. The way that it was handled, uh, you know, was, you know, was with a lot of the rhetoric of the days of the 70s and 80s, uh, new left uh, and everything, and could leave the door wide open for, uh, for, for those ac accusations. So, um, yeah, but as, um, you know, anti-Semitism, as we all know, is one of, it's not the only, but it's one of the major animating forces behind today's uh, far, uh, you're far right, and it's really. I think the work that Surge did. Uh, they have pamphlets just helping you think through as as a left activist, as a progressive activist, what could be un you know what 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 could be unconscious uh, anti-Semitism. I like to just call it anti-Jewish uh, Jew Jewishness. We got to think it's 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 to it's to the point. What could be unintentionally giving comfort to people uh, trying trying to exploit your rhetoric for their own needs, and uh, uh, maybe someone from Surge could put that in the uh, in in the chat uh, because it's a, it's a really good basic non rhetorical tool to help people think through these things. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's to single any group out about not handling anti semitism well. They're the left has always had difficulties handling anti-Semitism um, and discussing them. And I think it's also really difficult to parse through disingenuous accusations of anti-Semitism around anti-Zionism or, or, or critiques of Israeli nationalism and that kind of thing. Um, and so I think it's, it's sort of like a moving target in a way, something that people have to commit to study and development on because it's not just going to come naturally. And then the, the complexities of it and the way it works differently than other forms of racism is really important. And I think, you know, we all, you know, not everybody, but most people on this call, um, you know, is either grew up, grew up in or spent a lot of time in the United States. There are negative things that you receive about groups that you don't even, that you don't even know that you're regurg regurgitating. But that's why I think that the best way to confront these things is organizationally. Your organization should, uh, your political organization, your not nonprofit, wherever you're doing your activities should be looking at these uh, at these at these issues, should be looking at anti blackness, looking at anti Semitic and exploring these things together. Because if you try to go it alone, it's gonna be, it's always gonna be a um, you know, it's a guessing game. You you do your reading, you make your fumbles, but you have your friends and your comrades together. Uh, you can come up with some collective understandings and strategies to un undermine anti Semitism and all forms of bigotry. I think it's also a part of something that they, they talked about a lot was that this is a work of constant study and development. We couldn't expect something that happens in the 80s to be exactly how it would be approached today. It's sort of like a, a universal understanding that this is always going to be a process of becoming, that people should always work on those things, that it should be open to criticism, which was a big part of John Brown's a culture that they inherited from, from earlier radical groups, um, that this should be something that people are constantly looking to be self-critical about and develop on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a nice uh, segue, you know, we've seen some of the more clever parts of the far right become very skilled at co-opting left critiques around war, empire, corporate, and corporate power. How can anti-racists best guard against this without backing away from our opposition to war, empire, and corporate power? Yeah, I mean, anti-Zionism is, is one of the clearest examples of that. The far right loves to tout into anti-Zionism, obviously for completely different reasons than the left would. Um, and that's actually at the core of it. So you're going to find, uh, you know, we eventually call this third positionism. It's basically a, a, a quote unquote synthesis of the left and the right. It's not a synthesis of the left and the right. It's the far right employing far right values using left wing tactics and move, you know, movement uh, kind of approaches, strategies, things like that. 
basically cultural signifiers on the left, but for far right aims. And so you'll see them talk about how they're anti-war, you know, from an isolationist perspective, or they're anti-imperialist, meaning that uh, what, what they mean by that is they're really pro-nationalist, um, or that uh, they're anti-Zionist, but that for them it's actually code word for a Zionist world conspiracy, Zog, uh, Zionist occupation government, and the role of Jew, international Jews, and how they think that it controls world affairs uh, and finance capitalism, things like that. So I think what's really important for people is to look at what the core of a political analysis is. And I think that's actually really hard. I think a lot of times we are dealing with uh, the more, I don't know if I should say surface level, but the more everyday concepts of, of movement. So talking about imperialism, we're talking about, you know, state intervention between, you know, dominant, you know, global northern states um, in the global south, or we're talking about, you know, particular types of exploitation, uh, war crimes, things like that. We're not always talking about why it is we oppose imperialism or why we might impose, you know, expanded war or things like that. And I think it's important to actually get down to basics and to have not just a clear understanding ourselves, which we should, and I think sometimes we lack even that, that, that kind of level of consciousness, but then how we set expectations in a social movement uh, situation. The far right depends on the idea that we will assume our enemies' enemies are our friends, and that's not true. There's this concept that um, a lot of people write on. My, uh, the, the forward author, Matthew Lyons, um, who wrote forward from my book, writes a lot about this called three-way fight, that in a kind of revolutionary struggle or a struggle to improve the world, there might actually be more than two sides. It's not just necessarily the people and then like the oppressors they have. Sometimes there's people that are like you that both side with the oppressors or have their own kind of agency. A three-way fight, meaning the kind of a working class, the state, and then maybe the far right or insurgents that have their own kind of agenda. And I think we actually have to see uh, the issues in their complexity and not try and reduce them. And that happens oftentimes when we're talking about anti-imperial struggles that are not happening in the country that we live in, where it's easy to kind of boil things down. I think it's also incredibly attractive to ignore the faults of people we want to have allyship with in building a really good concerted social movement. And I think there's times when that makes total sense, but there needs to be limits to that. Um, and we need to ask really, really strong, hard questions of ourselves and others about whether or not they live up to even the most basic kind of enumeration of our values. And if what drives it, for example, anti-imperialism or a sense of anti-capitalism is a belief in human equality um, and a belief in, in supporting multicultural societies, things like that, that has to be a certain foundation and that has to be shared to a degree um, across uh, the movements that are being built. And so I think we need to look really hard at what is motivating people's politics. And that's going to be true in uh, at, you know, movements um, against like the Israeli settlers. It's going to be true of movements against uh, Wall Street. There's going to be um, far right people that want to exploit cracks in the movement for to further their own agenda. And people have to start to understand what is at the core of our politics so that their politics don't have a place there. I really wish Hillary was with us and uh, not sick in Berlin. We could really expand on this around, uh, around environment, the environmental movement and the far yeah. right's relationship to it, because uh, their their idea of how to uh, how to stop the world from burning uh, should be, I hope, hopefully, the exact opposite of everybody on um, in this in this event here. Um, I'll I'll find her uh, the link to to her um, her new ebook on that which is uh, very depressing, but absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it's brilliant. Well, I, I wanted to center back a little bit on contemporary anti-fascism and some of the lessons from John Brown. I wanted to see how you kind of explain the role of anti-Blackness, but also of Islamophobia in kind of constructing a comprehensive anti-fascism today. Yeah, well, let's start off with anti-Blackness. Um, so the way that in, the way that I was trained uh, early on was to, um, you know, by by my mentors was to really, really recognize anti-blackness in almost every social structure that we have in the United States. You know, um, not not just the clan, not just the clan, but in in insurance, in redlining, uh, in public, you know, all forms forms of of public policy, and. It's coming, you know. It's it's always been there from the very founding of what we call the United States to uh, today, but it's uh, you know, but the anti black anti blackness as a movement has really regathered its uh, its forces, right? You know, again, it's not certainly not an attitude. We can name the organizations that are thriving and growing from 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 anti blackness. So I think that. 
part of part of the challenge is to see the anti-blackness that comes that is expressed by the far right as an obst obstacle to be able to undermine the anti-blackness that uh, that we find in public policy because I, I come from a housing organizing background I would much rather be fighting for 10,000 units of social housing that and anti-gentrification than going out and dealing with with boneheads right so I see that you know the, the fascist movement is kind of like the, the defensive guard of a lot of public policy inequalities that we have they're all animated by by anti-blackness and because um, because, you know, because of the particular ways that anti-blackness and racial capitalism uh, works out, um, it drags everybody down in the end, which is, uh, you know, we, which is kind of the the, the paradox of white of, of white white, supre uh, white supremacy. Uh, why do why do people uh, embrace something that, in the long term, is going to hurt their own lives and fa and and families, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in 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 their in their their neighborhood, which implies that although you know the MSNBC worldview of seeing things is that it's all economic anxiety, there just happens to be a few million economically anxious white people that uh, want to that that want to vote for Trump. It's a lot, as Robin D G Kelly wrote in our forward, it's a lot more foundational that that than that. I think that the economic anxiety certainly is the kerosene on the flame of anti-blackness but it's um but that flame that flame was burning uh burning burning long before 2008 yeah yeah i think robert paxton called this the motivating passions uh where there's things that give energy but they don't change the fundamental conditions that came before that that runs a lot deeper okay yeah. and i think you know is islam islamophobia you know is you bring up bring up Islamophobia. Both of these these concepts are so multifaceted. It's very easy to say one truth and to say, well, what about this? What about that? Because it's just so multi multi layered. But I I believe that one you know one thing that we can say is true about Islamophobia is that it led you know since nine eleven it led to the to the resurgence of the far right. Mm -hmm. uh, that it was a tool. It was a stepping. It was the stepping stone. It was the organizing impetus. Impetus. It was an opportunity for people who had very nefarious um, goals for all of us to say, "Hey, we're all Americans, uh, brown, white, black, but we hate the Arabs, right?" And it allowed them to to build and rebuild a succession of white supremacist far right uh, far right organizations. So. Um, so yeah, I would. You, I don't really. I don't believe that you could be anti-fascist and and and, and anti-Muslim uh, at the same time. No, absolutely not. And we have to see the 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 fundamental role that Islamophobia has played in the rise of the contemporary far right infrastructure. Um, obviously, that's true in in the U.S., but it's probably even more true in Europe around like the, the quote unquote refugee crisis and the development of organizations like Pegida and the European Defense League. Um, but it's it ends up being so foundational that there has to be a really critical eye for how to support Muslim communities, for how to make them um, central in actual organizing, and how to center uh, not just folks in it, but actual Muslim organizations, so that they're having a voice in building these movements. Absolutely, in the in in the Bay Area, we're really lucky to have quite a few pretty amazing Arab and Muslim-led or, organizations like AROC and 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 others that uh, you know you actually would actually ha have a place to go to uh, to go ask how how can we be of how can we be of use in our mutual self defense. All right, so um, I'm look I'm looking forward to taking some of these questions from folks and hearing a poem from uh, from from Bill, but I do want to ask you one more one more question on my end is the issue of coalitions. So radical anti-fascists tend to see the far right as a logical outgrowth of the history of the United States. Liberal anti-fascists tend to see the far right as a betrayal of a set of American ideals, flawed but able to be improved upon. How how do we approach building coalitions between two camps knowing that we need we need as big a team as possible uh, to, uh, to, uh, to organize to win? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a big question. It's one that I think 
um, your book chronicles John Brown's struggle to answer the question. And I think they got some answers, but it's one that we're still, I think, looking for. So on the one hand, there is a, a militant anti-fascist tradition that sees particular strategies as effective. And, uh, and, there, and there's, you know, uh, obviously evidence to that being true. And then on the other side, there's kind of the use of large coalitions, which to create a large coalition, people have to moderate and um, compromise with one another to get a kind of mass of people. And my personal feeling about this is that um, the best form of organizing has a way of reaching the most number of people where they're at and brings them in in their own uniqueness. So what I mean by this is that having lots of organizations that approach uh, you know, the far right, however it's manifesting, in slightly unique ways, but along a certain line of agreement so that they're able to agree on a baseline of strategy, how they're going to deal with each other, how they're going to conduct themselves, and what their long-term goals are. Again, back to that point of having a baseline political agreement, not a complete political programmatic agreement, but just a baseline on what values and things are. So for example, as one way I talk about in the book, and I talk about this a lot just because I think it's a great example, right after uh, the Unite the Right on August 12th in 2017, uh, where Heather Howard was murdered and the final far right had an insurgency in Charlottesville, um, just a few days later, about 40,000 people hit the streets in Boston to stop what is relatively a small of a, you know, maybe a few dozen up to 100 Proud Boys and other far right supporters. Now, 40,000 people do what they want. 40,000 people take over cities. You know, there have been revolutionary movements with less than 40,000 people. 40,000 people, by virtue of their size, stops the event from taking place by any meaningful measure. And so I think people need to think about what is it going to take to get large masses of people, even on the militant anti-fascist side, things like no platforming, pushing people out of space, stuff like that, are accomplished by large coalitions. And so I think what's actually more important than thinking about what strategy works best, um, you know, what type of organization is the most best, I think the, the question people should be asking is, what can people bring to a large coordinated social movement? And the other part about this is, I, I, and I, I've had this discussion with anti-fascist organizers all across the political spectrum for this book and upcoming books um, about what they think, how they think of um, uh, what's the importance of anti-fascism. A lot of times they'll say the most important thing is to stop fascists. And I think that's probably true, but there's also another thing that happens in social movements where people become politically engaged and they become a part of their community and that changes them too. And that brings them into a larger civic engagement. And I think people should think about that as well. You know, so as the, the far right has different manifestations, maybe it's in the, the state and it's border policy, maybe it's an insurgent movement, things like that. How do you get the most number of people to say that, yeah, I can have agency over this situation. I can have can, the agency in my community, but I can also confront this threat and feel safe and feel a part of something. Awesome. Before we, we, we hear some questions from the chat, do you have any, any further questions about No Fascist USA? Anything? I mean, uh, I, you know, I, I, I can defer to the, 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 um, the questions in the chat. I, you know, I have the same question, I think, about what, what lessons do we have for coalition building and how we build a really kind of popular anti-fascist movement. Great. Well, thank you. This has been a fantastic conversation. It makes me wish that we lived in the same town so we could hang out and uh, and have these conversations all the time. But uh, your work, both on the ground and, and your scholarship, has been just absolutely fantastic. You have a new book coming out soon? Um, yeah, I have a book. It's a collection of essays called uh, Why We Fight, Essays on Fascism, Resistance, and Surviving the Apocalypse. And it comes out fall or uh, spring next year. Beautiful. What, uh, what, what publisher? AK Press. AK, right on. Okay. Uh, so City Lights folks, if it's yeah. possible, could we have, you... Uh, we have some go? questions. Oh, can uh, you... Bef before we get to that, could you uh, unmute uh, Mr. Crossman uh, from John Brown Anti-Clan Committee to share a poem with us? Sure. Let me see if I can find him. He's in the white hat. Okay. There we go. Right. Right next to Tony Ryan. Hey, Tony. Okay. Should be unmuted. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, this is a great webinar, Shane and James. Thank you so much. Um, I was one of the people that James interviewed for his book. Um, I was a member of the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee in the Bay Area. And, you know, I said, I was, but, you know, when the neo-Nazis came to the Civic Center in Berkeley a couple of years ago, there were we members of the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee from 
back in the day, carrying a strong banner and planting it right there in the Civic Center and being part of that protest that uh, scared the neo-Nazis to, along, I should say, with Antipa um, out of the Civic Center. So um, it's Sankofa, the past lives on in the present. Uh, thank you, James, for uh, for offering uh, a poem, letting me offer a poem. Um, this is from a new book, War in America. There's a cover, you can see it. Um, I think I'd like to read a poem called They Are Watching Asada's Daughter. I think everyone on the webinar knows Asada Shakur, um, a leader of the Black Panthers and the Black Liberation Army. Um, she was captured, uh, escaped with help from comrades in 1979, uh, went underground uh, for a few years and emerged in Cuba, where the Cuban government gave her uh, asylum and has pledged right up till today not to extradite her to the US. During that time that Asada escaped and before she emerged in Cuba, um, we had Asada's welcome here, uh, posters in our windows and so on, but also um, we were sure that Asada had a daughter, Kikuya, and we were sure that the, of course, the uh, the government was following Akuya, looking to see if there was a clue to see where Asada was. So this is a poem called, They Are Watching Asada's Daughter. They're watching Asada's daughter like they watched her born screaming in a cell in Rikers Island, then immediately stole her from this camp where babies are not supposed to be born, from this woman who is not supposed to be permitted to conceive this small blood victory for black freedom. They're watching Asada's daughter like they watched the movement of African people on the New Jersey Turnpike in 1973, scanning car windows and license plates to study the deployment of guerrilla troops, spotting a car they wanted, their gunfire met gunfire. Zaid Shakur killed, but not before one of theirs was taken out. Asada Shakur escaping and later captured. I'm sorry, Sundiata Kohli escaping and later captured. Asada critically wounded, but carrying it on. There's, sorry, they're watching Asada's daughter like they watched Asada and her comrades drive out the gates of New Jersey Women's Prison in November 2nd, 1979, a camp this woman was not supposed to be able to escape from, like they watched the movement of all African people in Harlem and Havana hallways for Kaikuya's mother, whose love for all black children guides her fight to free the land. And I should mention that the US now has a $2 million bounty on Asada's capture and return to the US. Obama raised it from 1 million to 2 million. So free all political prisoners, you younger, Folks on this, um, please don't forget the political prisoners, the, the black, the indigenous, the Puerto Rican, uh, and the white anti-imperialists who are still in prison, many of them serving 40 or 50 years, moving on to an 85 year sentence. So we've got to free them all now. Thanks. Hey, thanks. I think it's only, um only fitting that at a City, City Lights co-sponsored reading that we have some poetry, especially your amazing poetry. So uh, Peter, 
Really beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Bill. That was great. Um, so, uh, first question: Could you talk about the role of social media in organizing? What are the positive and negative sides of how we use social media for change? You take that one, Shane. You use it a lot more than I do. I do. I'm very online. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think that the, that the the the, comp the complexity of social media and organizing is the same as it is in the rest of society. Um, it can breed detachment um, from committed committed organizing, which a lot of times requires people to be in physical spaces, commit to physical spaces, and to be attending things and being responsible in that kind of way. Uh, at the same time, though, it has really big advantages. You know, folks that cannot get out the spaces, um, folks with you know with with disabilities that might keep them out from from certain spaces or, you know, now the, the coronavirus, um, it really highlighted that. So it also gives people tools. I think the question, sometimes it's less social media and more about relationships. And I think people use social media as a proxy for the fact that we don't have strong relationships and that's not social media's fault. There's a lot of reasons why that happens, you know? Um, and it's, you know, in a lot of ways, our difficulty to build social movements is a sort of reflection of the inability of churches to maintain themselves and for people to maintain social spaces that are non-commercial. And so I think the bigger question is going to be, how do we rebuild a community where we have real stake in each other uh, and real strong relationships? And that can use social media and it can be in person, but the point is going to be each other, not the tool. Yeah. Uh, one, of, one of the things I think about social media is somebody who has pro probably looked at many, many, many records of letters that people used to write, both in the new left of the 60s and in the 30s as part of historical research. Back in the day when people wanted to tell each other off, they would say, dear comrade. <laughs> and then here's the things we agree on. It's so good to hear you. And then they would go to the blast part and it would be meticulously argued and wonderf wonderfully um reasoned and footnoted and things like that. And you these 10 page uh, inner movement uh, letters where people were disagreeing with each other, but really digging deep into the thoughts. And we lose a lot of that in social media. And uh, that's, um, and that, that, that's, that's a really big problem. I think I want to go back to those long dear comrade letters. I have my students, sometimes I have them imagine a Twitter fight uh, between Frederick Douglass and John Brown about uh, whether whether or not to uh, to lead the Harper's Harper's Ferry uh, raid or not, and have them imagine what that would look like, and it obviously takes a lot of the meaning out when we're just arguing in 140 ca 40 characters. Another thing about social media that is really important is the idea about security, right? I mean, let's leave for a second leave the big questions about these multi-million. Uh, multi-billion dollar uh, tech companies and their influence, but what we leave on social media when we critique one another, right? What do we leave for uh, for, for others to, to look like? In that wonderful book from, I think, the 90s, War at Home, Brian Glick talks about COINTELPRO, and he talks about practical ways to deal with disruption of your movements, and one of it is just like, trace the source of any disturbing news that you get f through face-to-face -face communication. And oftentimes in social media, we hear something disturbing, we hear an accusation and everything. We, uh, everything. we see a photo that's, and photos are just, you know, nanoseconds in time and we don't investigate it. We just start retweeting and condemning and, 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 and flexing our ideological muscles and our righteousness, our virtue signals. And we got to get off of that because the other, the other side will, will take our lazy, laziness and use it to drive imprisonments, grand jury, and division. So there's a, a question for uh, James and Hillary. Um, you mentioned the role of lesbians in the leadership of JBAKC. Would you say more about that? Yeah, I think that was from Chris Dixon. Hey, Chris. Uh, so I think that, you know, this is going to be really simplistic. Uh, but if you look at the anti-imperialist milieu of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the backbone was largely radical feminists uh, that, and largely radical feminist le lesbians who did so much of the hard work, not just in John Brown, but in so many groups that weren't directly related to their uh, to their lives as, as lesbians, confronting uh, 
co confronting racism, organizing factories, doing some of the best uh, tenant organizing uh, in the history of tenant organizing. So, uh, so th that sense, I really don't see that uh, John Brown's experience uh, and in this is is that is that difference? You had a bunch of really hardworking anti-imperialist lesbians that were uh, willing to to roll up their sleeves and oftentimes work with work with people who weren't exactly enlightened or woke, as they say now, on the issues of homophobia, but trying to build a movement nonetheless. Um, fantastic book to read, Emily Hobson's uh, La uh, Lav Lavender and Red. I hope I'm getting it correct, but. Fantastic, fantastic book about uh, queer participation in anti-imperialist movements. Uh, here's another question for the both of you. Uh, what are the opportunities posed by the COVID crisis for social change? Take it away, Shane. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was working on this, this article about the Common Ground Collective in um, around Hurricane Katrina, it was in 2005 in New, uh, New Orleans, and basically, you know, New Orleans was devastated, and so people got together, and uh, former Black Panthers and other folks got together and built, like, a, a clinic and, and, and a bunch of other, I mean, like, it, it, it's kind of astounding the level of, of things that they, they built on, uh, on what was intended to be a directly democratic framework. One of the things that, that Scott Crow, who wrote a, a book about this, and other people talked about was that when an infrastructure is sort of taken away, there is an opportunity. We don't like to say it's an opportunity because that's sort of morbid in a way, but there is an opportunity to build something new. And in a way with coronavirus, not necessarily, it's not like a hurricane coming and knocking down buildings, but it is breaking down certain institutions and social relationships. And so we should try and uh, figure out how we can take what we want as a part of survival and start to build new things. And people have done this. They built mutual aid networks to get people what they need who are stuck in quarantine and, and, and couldn't go out and things like that. That's a new thing. And it's one that's going to be incredibly necessary in the coming months as a eviction crisis plays itself out, as uh, other things having to do with unemployment continue, as the economy tanks, as people are facing really serious long-term effects of this those structures that were built to help people just get through the day, those can be transmuted to something new. So let's think about the coronavirus as a place to build things when other things have collapsed. I'm a little bit more pessimistic about the coronavirus thing, but certainly uh, there's massive amounts of opportunities because people are, are naturally coming to a space where they're questioning everything, the housing situation, healthcare, things like that. And if we're not actively proposing ideas from people who have an egalitarian, sharply anti-racist and anti-imperialist analysis, the right's going to come in with its own answers, as we've seen, seen over again. So it's certainly not something that we should ignore or, or whatnot. Unfortunately, so much of what we've been able to regain as far as our organizing tools has been um, is fairly limited and leads back only to electoral politics. And I'm all about voting. I, 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 I think the voting is, is an extremely important thing to do, but I also think that taking absolute direct action, organizing workplaces, going out on picket lines, um, those, that, those things are, are what actually build, builds our movement and strengthens our movement and keeps the, the independence. And we've, we've been so creative with, with I think, the activist world has maxed out our innovations on Zoom. I think we've done a great job at being able to do accountability sessions and get the word out, all you know, using online tools. But we're 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 definitely hitting up hit, hit, hitting hitting a hitting a wall where our choice is: do we just stay behind screens, or do we risk our lives out there in the streets or or whatnot? I don't have any answers, but I know that that is that is going to be one of the key challenges of organizing and mobilizing, and and at least for the next two years. I think also just to, to to be real, coronavirus isn't keeping people off the streets as much as I think people thought. You know, with the with the murder of George Floyd and the protests that came have come. You know, people are out in the streets. You know, I was out in the streets of Portland this weekend. Thousands of people there, all wearing masks and being good and safe. But um, but definitely people are, are are coming out. I think people are thinking about how spaces can be safer too, which hopefully will be good for everyone in the long run. Yeah, but mutual aid 
mutual politicize mutual aid. I mean, any type of act of compassion to keep another human being safe and and, and well during this pandemic is worthwhile. But as organizers that want to build a movement, politicized of uh, mutual aid, mutual aid that build at least builds up the survival. Uh, yeah, the survival potential of of communities that are under under the gun, and we're all going to be under the gun sooner or later. Um, I think that that that's re really important. That's something that we can take from the history of the Black Panther Party and Common Ground and many other many other uh, forms of politicized uh, mutual aid. Well, we're uh, coming up on our second hour. So I think we need to, to wrap this up, but uh, this has been really wonderful. Um, and, and I think for those of you who haven't had a chance to read No Fascist USA, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful historical account, a blueprint for action, a rallying cry. Um, please do pick one up, uh, support our sponsor tonight. We've got the links on the um, chat function. And uh, I want to take a moment to really thank you, James. Thank you, Shane, for putting together just a kick-ass program. It's been really wonderful. Um, I want to remind everybody, too, that, you know, we've got three more events. We've got uh, this coming Saturday, August the 8th, uh, Wooden Shoe Books in Philadelphia is going to be co-sponsoring. And we're going to be featuring Dr. Edward Anaki with that on Sunday, August the 9th. Uh, we're going to have Mark Bray, um, and it's going to be over at Powell's Bookstore in Portland as a co-sponsor on Thursday, August the 27th with Susan Reverby, and that's going to be uh, sponsored by Carmichael's Bookstore in Louisville. Uh, SURJ is going to be co-sponsoring that. Uh, so you uh, can register on the City Lights website, uh, and just go to citylights.com. Um, thank you all. This has been really fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for being yeah. here. Uh, fairly easy. To, if anybody has a burning question that they would like to send, uh, send send to either one of us. You can use my public email, which is James Tracy SF at gmail dot com. Uh, I will promise you a response. I will not promise you a uh, an immediate response, and I may pass pass a question on to uh, to Bill or, Bill Bill or Shane or Hillary. Uh, I hope that folks will tune in if they're not not sick of hearing this story. I think the dialogues with with uh, these amazing authors and thinkers and organizers uh, will be really uh, wonderful and add add to our analysis. And also, we will hope to have Hillary Moore back by Saturday. Right on. Well, we send our love to her. Thanks, James. All right, All right. everybody, be well. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Be well.